Our title this evening is another one of those one-word titles, and it gives you so much information, I know. Faith. Faith. Let's take a fresh look, or at least a closer look, at a word, concept, that as Christians we might take for granted. We might think, yeah, I know about faith, I have faith, I'm a part of what's known as the Christian faith, I got all of that. But we might need to, ever so often, re-examine certain ideas like faith. A few months back, it was back in April, we, we did this with grace on a Sunday evening. And in, in a lot of ways, this sermon, it's not really a part two, but it's somewhat of a follow-up, like you're going back to, to check in again, a follow-up to that thought. 90% of those who grow up, now you can take this statistic for what it is, okay? There's some context here. This is across Christendom. But statistically, 90% of those who grow up in what would be labeled an evangelical home will make some sort of decision. And again, what that looks like whether it's a prayer or it's baptism or whatever, that, that's beside the point, beside the statistic. The statistic is just that 90% of the children that grow up in a home that's evangelical will make some sort of decision to follow Jesus, to have faith, to be a part of that movement, following Jesus. How many do you think are still following Jesus in any real way. Again, details and all that may or may not mean aside, just any form of following Jesus by the time they're 35. Now there's 90% when they're growing up. Before they leave home, they're going to make a decision to follow Jesus. By the time they're 35, only 22 still have some form of following Jesus in their life. Now, thankfully, this is just the beginning of the sermon, so we're not going to stop there. But why is that? And the rest of this sermon is not specifically focused on answering that question. But I believe it's related closely. Could it be, I'm just raising this as a possibility, could it be that something about the way that Jesus is taught, something about the gospel and the way that it is explained, something about even the nature of faith and how it is defined, how it is seen, might be involved in that discrepancy. How do we go from 90 to 22%? So on that note then, let's look together at some things that faith is, faith is this evening. As we look through the New Testament, as we look through the Bible, and we'll bring in some, some history and some other things slightly, I hope to not overdo that as we explore, these three might be the, the pegs to pin faith on for this evening. As often, this is not an exhaustive, there's a lot more we could say, and perhaps we will say in the future about faith, but, I, but at least these th three things tonight, that faith is more. That faith is more than commonly made out to be. We'll, we'll have to say more about that in a moment. Then secondly, that faith is tied to the gospel. And then thirdly, that faith is about grace. hope that's on the screen. What is faith? We hear a lot of different answers. Sometimes faith is just a warm feeling. It's something, somebody says this, I just feel something in my heart, and that's, that's my faith. Sometimes faith is seen as, along that, it's seen as this positive outlook. I've just got faith that things are going to be okay. Everything's going to turn out good for me. Other times, faith is seen as opposed to things like reason, logic, evidence. There are things that are based on evidence, and then there's things that are faith-based, and that's different. 
Sometimes faith is opposed to all behaviors or anything that involves actions or works. It's like those two are are enemies, or at least they're in completely different camps. Sometimes faith is described by those outside of faith as, quote, a blind leap in the dark. Fortunately, in my estimation, that is sometimes how those within Christianity at large portray faith. I don't really have any reason or logic. It's just what I believe. Why do I believe it? Because I believe it. I suggest these three might help us navigate those ideas. What is faith? Faith is more. Faith is more. Let's do a quick bit of background this evening. Let's take the English word itself, faith. You ever looked at where that originates? It goes back to some Anglo-French and some Latin. So everybody get ready, okay? Raise your hand if you speak Anglo-French and Latin. Okay, we got one on the front here. I mean, Willow is starting early. That's, that's great. They don't really teach Latin anymore, but apparently, okay. Well, I don't know what to do now. I guess sermon's over. Y'all don't speak that. But it comes from this definition The original definition of faith as an English word from the early 13th century went something like this. To put trust in someone and give loyalty to them. Faith, the English word originally meant. Now, in the 14th century, this new definition shows up and it it is to mentally assent to certain facts. And you could go back you could go back further. And, and there were some writers, some Christian writers within about the 3rd and 4th century that started focusing in on faith as just something that happens inside you. But in, in the scriptures, faith is visible. Sure it's internal, but it's it's also external. Something you can see. You can see someone's faith. It's actually said a couple of times in the Bible, right? I see your faith. You prove your faith. And then it's, as you study history, in the 15th, 14th and 15th century, kind of coming out of that English definition, out of what's called the Reformation movement, this idea of faith only arose. And faith meant mental agreement. I agree this is true. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Might be one way that it's put. And that, that alone. I, I believe that's true and that saves me. Or it might have an emotional component that's called trust. I, emo- I feel about Jesus in a trustworthy way. I'm putting my faith or I'm putting my trust in Jesus. And I, I trust him to save me. I might say what's called a sinner's prayer, and then I'm I'm on my way to heaven. And usually that includes, if I did that once, it doesn't matter what happens after that, I'm saved. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Although I think that's about about a marriage. But anyway, that was an idea that arose about 500, 600 years ago. It's fairly young in the 2,000 years of Christianity's history. Let's look at some passages then in light of that. Here's some text to consider this evening. Let's look at Titus chapter 2, verse 10. Titus chapter 2, verse 10. You'll notice that there are at least one, I think there's one or two extra passages on your handout if you picked up one. We're not going to be able to look at all of these in any depth. A couple of them we'll just reference this evening. But in Titus chapter 2, as Paul writes giving instructions to Titus about how to instruct different demographics in Crete, from the old to the young, the men, the women, everybody in between. Part of that is this. Look at this last statement. It begins in verse 10 as but, and the English standard says, but showing all good faith. Notice that word showing. There's that concept that faith can be seen. It's not just a private thing. It's not just something you feel in your heart. It's 
something that somebody can see. And if you're, if you're reading from the King James translation this evening, it says fidelity, good fidelity, which is an English word that does still mean more loyalty to someone or even a cause. You sign up, you volunteer. What did we sing? He needs brave volunteers. And I'm glad that Chance volunteered to sing that song prior to the sermon tonight. Good fidelity. And it's the same word. The word here is the word that we translate faith throughout the New Testament. It's the same Greek word. And look at the, the, way the, what, the way the verse ends. If I can get my words out here. It says, so that in everything they may adorn, like you're putting something on to be visible, the doctrine of God, our Savior. So show, adorn, doctrine or teaching that's about showing faith that's good. Maybe implying that there's a way to have bad faith. And we use that sometimes more in the context of companies and bad or governments and things. We have bad faith, a broken trust. And that seems to be the idea here, show yourself as someone that's trustworthy. Have faith. Let's look at Romans chapter 3. I think that's the next passage. All right. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. As Paul discusses God's relationship with both Jew and non-Jew, how God gave the oracles or he entrusted the oracles of God, the Hebrew scriptures, the law, to the Jews and gave them special promises and both obligations and privileges, he writes this in Romans chapter 3, verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faith nullify the faith of God? Is that what yours says? Shake or nod? No. I mean, you can't see it if you, had, if you could see it. Not what mine says either. So let's read it again. It says, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness? Keep in mind, we're still reading the same word that we translate sometimes faith, sometimes fidelity, and now faithfulness. Partly because of the context. But that's why faith is more. Faith is more than just one sense, like, I agree this is true, or even, I trust you. It's broader than that. It is more than that. This one word has a number of senses or ideas within it. Over the years, sometimes the word has been pushed and squeezed to where it is pretty restricted, pretty limited definition. Faith means this, and that's it. Romans 3.3 3 is about God's faith. Is, that, is it about God believing in people? That they're real? No. Is it about God trusting people? No. Now, both of those ideas can be faith, but faith is more. Here, faith is faithfulness. It's God's faithfulness. God was reliable. God was loyal to his people, even when they weren't loyal or faithful they were faithless. The two English words there, as we translate them, are unfaithful and faithless. Now go over to verse 21, Romans chapter 3. This is the next time in the, the letter to the Romans that the word faith is used. Romans chapter 3, 21 and 22. He says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith. Well, what does that mean? Well, we'd have to back up and think about it. Does it just mean agreeing that Jesus is real or trusting that Jesus died to save you? Or is it that and more? Could it include faithfulness? Now here Paul's contrasting this with with the, the, the law of Moses. It is not about a, a system of works where you perform to get something or you somehow earn something or 
a rule-based system like that. But at the same time, are we sure that faith doesn't include certain actions, faithfulness to Jesus? He says it's by through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe or all who have this quality about them we call belief or faith. But it might just be more or bigger than we first think. Let's look at another example. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 or verse 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. I knew chapter 2 didn't sound right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. This is in Paul's salutation to them. He's giving thanks for them to God. Remembering, he says in verse 3, before our God and Father, your work of faith, that might be interesting, and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Here's how faith had worked its way out in them. And so it's a work of faith. Conviction came from that faith. They've got convictions that lead to behavior. And then this one's a pretty quick one. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Let's just read this one. And look at how it's translated in virtually all English text. Matthew 23, 23. We are right in the middle. I, I believe I, I can say that in, in this part of the country, that we are slap dab in the middle. Okay, Of Jesus' extensive rebukes on the scribes and the Pharisees. The whole chapter as we have it, is all these woes, woe to you for this and that, and here's what's going to happen to you if you don't change this. Here's one of those. Matthew 23, 23. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected, watch this, the weightier matters of the law. So this is still even under the law of Moses for this context. And here they are. Here's the big things. Justice and mercy and faith. Well, y- y'all know how, how, how we're working this now, right? Yeah, it's not what it says. It says faithfulness. But it's the word for just faith. Faith is more. It's listed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. One of the, part of the fruit of the Spirit is what we translate as faithful. Almost every time we translate that verse and it's faithfulness. But it is the same word. Now one more example before we have to move on. That's in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Last few verses of this gospel account. John 2, 23 through 25. I call this back to back because the word for faith is used twice Back to back, not, not next to each other in, in the sentence, but really close here. Let's see if we can find it, find these two uses of the word. John chapter 2, 23 and 20, 2, 25. It says, Now when, when he was in Jerusalem and at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. See, I should have read that a bit less emphasized. But anyway, it says, When they saw the signs that he was doing, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, Because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. Did you catch them? The first one's easy, at least easier. It's where they believed. They had some kind of faith in Jesus. Where's the second one? It's about Jesus. It's almost like Romans 3. It's different, but it's a similar concept where You've got the word used of humanity and then used of deity. Here it's used of one who is divine and human. But it's when it says in English standard that Jesus did not entrust himself. The word English word trust is in there. And so there, right here, back to back, the same word is used in two pretty different ways. One is a superficial acceptance, maybe. 
The other is that Jesus didn't give himself over to them. He didn't commit himself to borrow from this morning's sermon. So some possible synonyms for the English word faith. Faithfulness, fidelity, and even loyal. I'm not saying that we need to rip the word faith out of our Bibles or anything like that. But there are other English terms that can be difficult because of the way they have been used and misused. The word church in English. What about the word baptism in English? Maybe there's a place for throwing in some other terms, at least in our thoughts and our conversations. And then very briefly, before we do have to move on, Here's a couple of quotes. This is a letter to a king, King Demetrius. This is, this is not scripture. This is a writing written during the time of Jesus. It says, Since you have kept your agreement with us and have continued your friendship with us and have not sided with our enemies, we have heard of it and rejoice. Now continue to keep whatever this word is that we translate faith, so keep faith with us, and we will repay you for what you do for us. Faith is more. This one. It's about a time when the Jews were under occupation by a pagan king, and there were some difficulties, there were some adjustments to be made, and there were some accusations about the Jews that they were not being what they should be to the king. And here's a statement made. The Jews, however, continued to maintain goodwill and unswerving faith, or this English translation of this writing, written in, in Greek originally, says unswerving loyalty toward the dynasty. Faith is more. And then this one segues to our second peg tonight. Josephus. Anybody heard of Josephus? Raise your hand. Okay. He's a Jewish historian. He was also a general in the Jewish wars. Here's something he said. He said, he wrote about this, he writes that one day he ran across a Jew and he told them, repent and believe in me. That's one way of translating it at least. Does that sound familiar? Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, if you want to look it up, he says the same exact thing. Slightly different on the end. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now what is Josephus saying to his fellow Jew? He's saying, you need to agree that I am who I say I am, or you need to, to trust me to save you. Again, I'm not saying those aren't a part of our faith. But the example is that Josephus is saying, you need to change the direction you're going, change what cause you're supporting, and start, start fighting with me against the enemy. Be loyal. To me. So, faith is more part of why? Because faith is tied directly to the gospel. It is the gospel. It hasn't been that long since we've examined some passages like Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that are some of those key texts that outline the basic ideas of the gospel. And so we're not going to go there tonight. Instead, let's go back to another passage that should be still fairly familiar to us as Christians. Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. And I hit the button too soon. We're going to wait on that one, all right? What is the gospel? Acts chapter 2. Where does Peter go with the gospel? Does he say, Jesus is real, you need to believe in Jesus, and that's all you need to know. Shake or nod? No. Does he say Jesus died for your sins so you could be saved and that's it? No. He mentions Jesus, his life and ministry. He mentions his death quite emphatically. And then he says God raised him up. The resurrection. But does he stop there? Let's read the last verse here in that passage, Acts 2, verse 36. 
Now, it's often been pointed out that it seems like Peter may have gone on or would have gone on to say more if he were not interrupted. So I'm not going to say this is the end of the sermon. He says many more words later, verse 41 says. But here is where the gospel message leads. It doesn't stop with Jesus himself, his death, or even his resurrection. Acts 2.36 says this, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. That's where he ends up. And one of the things that's important here to, to take to consider is that this is the one that is still ongoing of all the things in the gospel. Jesus' life on the earth, his death, his resurrection, those are past events, incredibly significant events, and key to the good news, key to the story of Jesus. You can't tell the story of Jesus properly without them. But he was raised to ascend to the throne as Lord and Christ. And Christ isn't a nickname or a last name or just some extra fluff it means something like Messiah or King. And then we're called to have faith toward the King. What do kings ask for? One thing they ask, really demand, of their subjects is confession. Isn't that what Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10 says? To confess that Jesus is. Well, is what? Romans 10, 9 says, confess that Jesus is Lord. And then believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Resurrection and Lordship. It's a confession or even a profession of loyalty. Or fealty would be the more kingly term. Compare 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, and its context. Paul says, Timothy, you remember the good confession you made? And then what do you do? You keep the good commandment of Jesus. This faith and the gospel and my actions, my response with my mouth and with my behavior, they all matter. Let's look at one more. Romans chapter 1. Verse 5. Romans 1, verse 5. And then we have a couple other references from Romans. As you're turning there, think about this with me. Let's say you show up in a land where there are still, there's still a monarchy, there's a king on the throne. And you go out into his territory and you find some subjects along the way. And you ask them, well, what's your relationship with the king? I say, oh, Let's say they speak English. They say, we have faith in our king. I say, well, what, what does that mean? They say, well, we believe he's real. You know, he, he, he exists. I can go show you on his, his castle. And we've said some words in our heart that he's going to take care of us. And then they pause. And so you might pipe up and ask, well, what, what else? Does, does, does it have anything to do with the way you live? I mean, you're a subject, right? Does that mean you're to give allegiance or fealty, faithfulness to the king? And Well, then they say, well, no. We, we've, we believe it in our hearts, and we've, we've said it and prayed it. We just live however we want now, and he's going to take care of us in the end. How would that work? Romans chapter 1 Verse 5, you kind of got to look at 5 through 7, I suppose, to get the gist of this passage. But if you back up to the beginning of the letter, he's referencing the gospel and some of those key facts. Jesus is the son of David. He was raised from the dead. Romans 1, 2, 3, 4. And so in verse 5, he says, Through him, this is Romans 1, 5, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. 
Well, it actually says the obedience of faith. So what is the aim of the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus lived, died, rose again to be king. Confess your loyalty to him. And then the goal, the aim, isn't just that. It's obedience to the king. The very same thing is in Romans chapter 16, the end of the letter. Paul's talking about the gospel and says the gospel is to bring about almost the exact same thing. It's just some different words and then the same phrase, to bring about the obedience of faith. So when we say that faith is more, part of what it does include is this loyalty to the king. Because faith is tied to that gospel. And if we stop short and say, Jesus died, believe it. Jesus rose for you, put your trust in him. And we leave off the reality that Jesus is currently the reigning king, who, by the way, is coming back someday as the returning king to punish his enemies and reward his loyal subjects. That kind of sounds like a parable. I think the context of the parable is a little different, but the language is the same. Faith is tied to the gospel. Now let's bring it home. Faith is more. Faith is about the gospel, but it's also about grace. It's about grace. Make sure we're... All right. One of the things we discussed in that previous sermon focused on grace was that grace wasn't a religious term. Not, in, not inherently like it is today in Paul and Jesus' day. I didn't mean to put those in that order, okay? Paul's the one who uses the word. The same thing is true of faith. We saw some examples of that earlier. Some of those historical writers, Josephus and others. The faith wasn't inherently religious. It has become that. So that we say, thing, we say faith and everybody automatically thinks religion, Jesus. We also discussed the idea of patronage, where you've got a patron and clients, and the patron gives grace, and the client returns grace for grace. They also use this word, we translate faith, for the response of the client to the patron. Look at how this works. It works in Romans chapter 6, the end of this chapter, Romans 6, 20 through 23. A sermon or a, a chapter about immersion into Jesus. Look at it. The word faith is not used here. But the concept, I'm convinced, is here. And I don't see that this chapter is somehow opposed or counter to the first five chapters of Romans that do speak quite a bit about faith as well as grace. Romans 6, verse 20, he says, For when you were slaves of sin... You were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, oddly enough, the language here is even stronger than subject to a king. It's slaves to a master. Slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. By the way, it's not a one-and-done thing. You've got something called faith, and then you've got eternal life, you're done. It's loyalty to the king, sanctification, behavior change, eternal life. And then verse 23, 4, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, we noted previously that it's just gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord or the grace of God. So God extends His grace. He gives, and we respond in submission, in loyalty, in following Him. Not perfectly, 
king does not require perfection of his subjects, not a good king. But there's a difference between that and faithfulness. Just like with your spouse. I mean, some people kind of seem to to demand perfection of their spouse. But most of us simply ask for faithfulness. And we know the difference in marriage. Sometimes we get a little fuzzy with Jesus. And it's not always easy. Second, or first Peter chapter one, six through nine. It's where Peter tells them, you've had all these trials, tested the genuineness of your faith, but you're rejoicing even in that because you know your faith leads to the outcome of salvation. And then look at verse 10, 1 Peter 1, verse 10. He's talking about their faith, it being tested to see if it's real. Is there a fake faith? We could go to James here and talk about faith by itself without faith works or without behavior it's a it's not real it's dead but just look at this in verse 10 he says concerning this salvation that comes from faith the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours grace faith genuineness and then two more verses verse 13 therefore preparing your minds for action and being sober minded set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So grace now, grace later. And then verse 14, as obedient children. And he starts talking about actions, obedience, and holiness. Right on the heels of faith that's real because of grace. And then, We'll close with this one. Would you say, and don't shake or not on this one, would you say that we are going to be judged someday on the basis of our works? That's when somebody pipes up and says, well, no, salvation is by faith. They might even say by faith alone or by grace through faith. We're saved by grace. We're saved through faith. Amen. But in the very same letter that Paul says we are saved through through faith, by grace, he says this, Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Romans 2, 6 through 11. He says, He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. That sounds like Romans 6, 23. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, Jew first and also the Greek. The glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. He gives it It's grace. He's not saying you're somehow going to earn it. Or you get there and say, I did more good than evil, God. You've got to give me eternal life. But at the same time, there is some way that how I live now, whether I am loyal or not to the king, matters. And it's still by the gospel. Verse 16 of Romans chapter Faith is about grace, but that works both ways. Because faith is more, faith is tied to the gospel that says Jesus is king. Therefore, grace and salvation include how I work in this life. I'm not sure that works is this evil thing that faith destroys. As much as faith and works for the king are in the same bucket together. Faith. Faith is. Three thoughts for your Sunday evening. If faith is more than just 
what I agree is true, just what I feel and trust, then the question when we ask, do you have faith in Jesus, is more. It's stronger. It's far more demanding than otherwise thought. And it also means that I can be baptized into Jesus, Romans 6, become his subject, loyal to the king, and then, this doesn't mean I'm, I have troubles with sin. It doesn't mean I, I, I give in to temptation here and there because I'm fighting it. It's possible then to turn away from my king and commit high treason against King Jesus. When I begin to give my allegiance, my loyalty to something other than thee, do I have faith in Jesus this evening as we stand together and sing?